Okay, so as we thought about the day, we thought about that opening panel, setting the stage, and I hope we accomplished that. And then we thought about the next panel on improving maternal and child health. And we said, there's some good case studies you know, out there. And this may be one of them. While we know it's not solved, for sure it's part of the ongoing dialogue. And we figured out a way to really measure what improvement looks like. And so without further ado, I'll just quickly read Jamila's bio. Uh, Jamila Taylor is Director of Healthcare Reform and a Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation, where she leads their work to build an affordable, on the Affordable Care Act and develop the next generation of health reform to achieve high quality, affordable, and universal coverage in America. And as I told you, she is also going to be moving on to be president and CEO of the National WIC Association. Perfect. Um, so what? come on to the stage, Jamila, and bring up your wonderful panelists as well. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, well, thank you all so much for being here. And thank you, Naisha, for that lovely introduction. Um, you know, to say that I'm honored is an understatement. I'm up here with some of my very favorite people um, who also are the preeminent experts in the maternal health crisis in this country. Um, so with that said, I anticipate this being more of a discussion, conversation between us um, as friends and colleagues. So as mentioned, I'm Dr. Janila Taylor, and I currently serve as the Director of Healthcare Reform and Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation. I'm gonna start by first talking a little bit about, you know, how we come into this issue of maternal health. Um, we all focus on women of color in our work. Um, and so I think it's important to ground the conversation and talk about the reproductive justice framework. Um, and I'm gonna read this because I wanna make sure I get it right, even though we use this framework all the time in, in the work that we do. So reproductive justice is a term that was coined by black women in the mid 1990s at the International Conference on Population and Development. It's a human rights based structured approach that addresses the intersecting systems of oppression that prevent marginalized people, primarily women of color, from achieving complete bodily autonomy and parenting with dignity. So the focus of the conversation today is on solutions, right? And Naisha was very clear about that when we were sort of prepping for um, this event. And I think when we talk about the maternal health crisis, it's easy for us to focus on the problem, which is huge. It's multifactorial. There's not one solution that is gonna address this issue overall. So when we think about reproductive justice and what that means, it means that we recognize a woman's ability to determine her own reproductive destiny. We recognize that reproductive freedom is linked to the conditions within a birthing person's community. And we center women and birthing people of color and their unique experiences. We also recognize that health outcomes and access to healthcare are central factors that cannot be isolated from social issues such as economic opportunity, exposure to violence, or safe and affordable housing. I'll also make a note here that, you know, we use the term birthing people or pregnant people as a way to be inclusive, to use gender inclusive language, recognizing the fact that not every person with the capacity to get pregnant identifies as a woman. And these issues also impact those communities. So why don't we dive right in? I'm gonna start off by, you know, why don't I have each of you just go through and introduce yourselves, and why don't you just tell us a little bit about, you know, what brings you to this issue? What makes you passionate about working on maternal health? <laughs> of and course, Shelly, start, start with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, good morning, um, everyone. My name is Angela Doinsala Aina. Um, I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. Um, what brings me to the work of what we have really coined and ushered in of Black maternal health rights and justice is um, over 15 years of working at multiple levels. So at the community-based level, um, academia, 
um, namely Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, and um, at the state government level and at the federal level, uh, working across programs, research initiatives that have um, spanned the gamut of everything from teen pregnancy prevention to working with African immigrant um, refugees who are um, working with community-based organizations that are providing some form of birth justice work with those um, said populations to um, working on Zika, pregnancy, uh, Zika and pregnancy and emergency um, response. And so... In, that, um, in those many years of working at different levels, one of the things that really stood out to me is honestly the lack of representation, delegation of resources, the centering of scholarship of black women. And the fact that um, you have so much innovation um, that happens and continues to happen even under the most dire con conditions with almost little resources um, of Black women and Black-led organizations immediately um, taking a stance and responding to the immediate needs of their communities, and most especially in the area of maternal and reproductive health care services and programs. And so for me, um, just coming from a background of not just public health, but even black feminism, knowing that there needs to be more courageous efforts to build organizations that are led by us, that look like us, and that center our needs, and most especially from an intersectional perspective and being risk takers, right? To say that we need to invest in black women's leadership because we are the solutions that we have been seeking. We've been writing it for centuries. We've been organizing um, for centuries around a lot of these issues. And, the, and where we are now, um, which unfortunate, which the maternal mortality rates, infant mortality rates, it is unfortunate um, that it has continued to increase, but um, we are now at a place where we can, we can no longer be um, scared really to make those necessary investments and center black women's scholarship in this work. We need to do it unapologetically and utilizing reproductive justice. So that's what brings me to this work. All right, thank you so much, Angela. Larissa? Hi everybody, Brisa Hernandez, um, System Director at uh, Common Spirit Health and, and Population Health. Um, I think for me it's, it's extremely personal um, what has brought me into this. Um, the talk before um, that happened around structural racism really has in a lot of ways brought back a lot of my experience personally, my family's experience through healthcare, the healthcare system. But in particular around maternal health, I, um, I am originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico. That is a major immigrant gateway. We have a long history of Mexican immigrants and others coming there. So it's, it's just what it is, right? And healthcare is very used to taking care of patients from different countries, speaking Spanish, et cetera. Not the best, but there's you know more so. I moved to the Carolinas um, prior to having my first child and I became pregnant and I was in between jobs. So I applied for emergency Medicaid, which was not easy and they required a lot of runaround for me. So I was like, oh my gosh, if I'm you know, college educated, having trouble doing this in an in a, in a efficient way, I can't even imagine for somebody else that doesn't speak the language, you know, isn't from here, is from a different background. Um, all that to say, I experienced what it was like for a Medicaid mom in Charlotte, North Carolina to get care, mm -hmm. as opposed to my friends that I was meeting who, who were also having children, getting to go to different clinics and getting to see different doctors. And then I gave birth in the Medicaid section of the hospital. Now, mm -hmm. they, might not, they might not admit it right now that they were separating, mm -hmm. but it was very much separated. And the only reason I was able to get any level of care beyond what others were experiencing was because my mother-in-law is looks white. She's mixed. Um, she's half uh, Me Mexican, half white. But my father-in-law is white. He, she remarried. And we spoke English because they wanted to bring interpreters to me all the time. And I was like, no, I can, I can speak the language. It's fine. But, but they were like forcing them on me and I was like, no, it's okay. But that's the only reason I know I received any level of different care than others. And so 
that experience and then just, you know, with my children, et cetera, has just really impacted, right, the, 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 the way that I look at this and have since been able to engage in, in some work and in, in testing some innovative ways of engaging with, with um, pregnant people and, and supporting them through that journey. So I bring my lived experience into the work and um, I was really excited to hear that starting to come out in the other conversation. I, I'm sure we'll, it'll be a continued theme throughout. Um, but that's really what brings me advocating for, engaging, and intentionally and sincerely um, integrating the lived experience of our patients in our communities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Parrott? Yes. Good, good morning. Is it morning? Morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Jamila Parrott, also Jamila. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm an OBGYN in the D.C. area and the president and CEO of an organization called Physicians for Reproductive Health, where a network of doctors around the country advocating for comprehensive reproductive health care for the communities that we serve. And we do it in a number of ways, including work in the communication and narrative shifting space in the public conversation, and also in the political, public policy, and legislative space, really hoping to bring the voice of science and medicine to conversations about reproductive health rights and justice. Um, I don't have like a really neat, I don't, maybe nobody does, right, origin story, how I got to this work. Um, but I always knew I was gonna be a doctor. You, I was one of those kids that, um, you know, walked around with the, the plastic stethoscope and the fake doctor's <laughs> bag. Um, so it, I don't have a memory of ever wanting to be anything else. But I also grew up in DC. And it's nearly impossible to live in D.C., much less grow up there and not understand the impact of policy and legislation on the health and well-being of our community. So for me as a kid, it was really uh, clear that it didn't matter how much doctoring I did. There were people who were making laws that were harming us. Mm -hmm. And I think I naively believed that if I could just get to them, if I could explain to them the ways that their policies were harming our communities, then of course they couldn't behave in, in that way. Uh, so for me, the connection between healthcare delivery, uh, reproductive health, and, um, and public policy has always been a strong connection. And, and particularly thinking about it from my positionality as a physician, I know that um, no matter what I do, they would not invite Jamila to the White House or Jamila to testify in front of the Senate. Jamila Perry. Jamila Perry. They might invite Jamila Taylor. <laughs> They're not going to invite Jamila to come. But they will invite Dr. Perry and Dr. Taylor and all of the letters that come behind our name. And so for me, the question has always been, well, when you get there, what will you say? What will you do? Who are you going to fight for? Um, the last thing I'll say, because I know we don't have a ton of time about the origin stories, is um, is that piece around RJ, because I think it's really important. I was well into my career, delivering babies, providing contraceptive care, doing abortions long before I heard the term reproductive justice. I was well into practice. And so for someone to, to be trained in obstetrics and gynecology and never hear that phrase uttered in medical education, I want us to sit with that a little bit. I think it's, an in, it's insight into how totally uh, misaligned, misguided, I won't, this doesn't seem like a cussing conference, <laughs> messed up. That, <laughs> so I won't, I won't, this is, y'all don't seem like the type. So I'll pull it back a little bit. But it's terrible, right? And so I went, I was well into practice when I met um, some of the mothers of the RJ movement, Dr. Tony Bond and Professor Loretta Ross in particular. And my, my head exploded because I was trying for so many years to figure out a way to bring um, community mm -hmm. into the care that I provided. And I was living in these two parallel lives. I was doctoring during the day and I was organizing at night. So going to coalition meetings about affordable housing and food insecurity and gentrification and, and um, all of those things. And then doing, doing that as if they were two separate things. And so... Uh, I heard um, our colleague and friend, Dr. Karen Scott, say, uh, describe herself as a recovering OBGYN. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's an appropriate moniker for me, too. Uh, reproductive justice saved me from myself. Mm -hmm. And it made me to the kind of doctor that I knew I was always supposed to be. Okay, thank you all so much. Um, so, you know, most of you all may have heard about the 
statistics around the maternal health crisis. Um, first of all, we are in the midst of a crisis that's worsening. Um, the most recent data we have from the CDC is from 2020. Um, black women are three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes when compared to white women. Um, we also saw rates among Hispanic women increase by about 40% um, in that year, largely due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we heard earlier from the wonderful presentation of Dr. Smedley that systemic racism is a root cause that we see across these health disparities and the maternal health crisis is no different. Um, to kick things off, can you all talk a little bit about, you know, how and why this is about racism and not race? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely the maternal mortality, um, the maternal mortality rate and its ever increasing um, numbers over the years, particularly in the U.S., um, is definitely rooted in honestly, our history in the institution of slavery. Um, one of the reasons why um, at Black Mamas Matter Alliance, we talk about coming into the work of Black maternal health unapologetically centering Black feminism and reproductive justice is because we have to understand these um, different systemic um, oppressions, mm -hmm. but most importantly and specifically, um, the fact that the whole field of gynecology was honestly birth out birth out of um, utilizing the bodies of black women and not just utilizing the bodies of black women under um, really what we call obstetric violence you know and I mean it's, it was violent very violent but not just that but also utilizing um, uh, black women who were enslaved as what would later become our midwives and nurses you see what I'm saying? So not only the skill set, the, the traditional skill set of Black women's birthing traditions, but then also utilizing Black women's bodies to understand reprodu um, just the reproductive system, and then how that practice that, quote unquote, um, became into the medical practice of gynecology, and then the ways in which Black women's bodies were um, devalued ultimately is really at the root of how practice how it how it has ushered in those practices. Mm -hmm. Again, also we know that there have been intentional um, policies that were put in place um, at the turn of the century. Yes, in the name of um, addressing um, maternal and infant mortality from a public health infection improvement perspective, but um, unfortunately, some of the um, consequences out of that was that we started to see um, a, a, a demise and um, decrease of midwifery um, practice in our communities, especially around the black midwife, because we know that, that um, black midwives were essential in our communities, um, really, throughout the whole entire history of this country. And so, as we saw pregnancy, childbirth become more and more medicalized and patholo uh, patholicized. You know, that's why I said don't start with me, but you know, because yeah. <laughs> I'm it. looking at uh, Dr. Perry. But what I'm getting at is that these, um, unfortunately, these practices really um, ushered in how, where we ended up today. And the fact that we have so many issues around just quality maternity care, um, and even maternity and reproductive health care <laughs> that truly we want and need and want to see in our communities and we're not being listened to, being valued, um, those type of things. And so to see that be practiced over and over again from a health systems perspective um, really has been a significant contributor. And so that's how some of the structural racism, even the, um, the practices around how we engage um, you just gave that example mm -hmm. earlier, the dif differential um, care that's being provided to um, black and brown patients it is a significant contributor to maternal mortality. And if I could, if I could add, I think that, you know, I, I, I want to just highlight a little bit of a few of the things that Angela said, in particular, 
the history of gynecology, which I think that we often, um, not this group, right, but lots of folks, uh, gloss over um, the, the tremendous harm and not understanding that it is the foundation. We have a, a way in, in this country of holding tightly to an ahistorical perspective of things mm -hmm. because then we don't have to grapple with um, the implications for our current um, and future lives uh, based on what happened in the past. But the, the historical context in which the field of medicine, not just gynecology, medicine period grew out is what shapes mm -hmm. Um, our inequities in health and reproductive health in particular today. Uh, and so we have to, one, really understand that. And it, it begins really with this belief that there is, um, uh, Harriet Washington writes about it in Medical Apartheid. She calls it the myth of medical distinctiveness, this idea that, that disease manifests differently based on your race. And that belief is so deeply embedded uh, in medical culture and medical education that we see, we see it throughout history. We see it in experimentation and abuse, mm -hmm. certainly the development of the field of gynecology um, by Dr. Marion Sims, but also Dr. Stilwell, Dr. Bozeman, so many other physicians whose names we will never know. Um, not to mention the experimentation on on um, kids in Baltimore through the lead study um, program, and that was in the 90s, right? That's not a, a historical, that, well, my kid might say, I think they, what do they call it, the early 1900s? <laughs> early, <laughs> so, um, but all of those things really factor in to allowing us in the medical field to treat health inequities as a biological inevitability. Mm -hmm. So we never have to grapple with what is causing these racialized outcomes. How do we understand the way that race is used in medicine, in research, in science, and the way that that definition of race and the contextualization of race, not the racialized experience that people have in our healthcare system, but race is used as a proxy incorrectly mm -hmm. for all kinds of things, mm -hmm. uh, right? And it allows mm -hmm. us to, to spend our, all of our time in disparity discovery. What are the, dis what are the disparate differences in, in heart disease? How do we, well, in black people, right? Brown people. How do we talk about the differences in maternal mortality and infant mortality? We racialize them, not the racialized context, but the race specifically. So then we can always say, well, these are these racialized outcomes. We're not sure why it's happening. And it is because of the work of organizers on the ground, the folks at BMMA, the folks at, in, in community-based organizations around the country, that we have the language to actually say the words, right? It is racism. Mm -hmm. It is not because I'm black. I can't educate my way out of this. I can't earn my way out of this. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how much money I make, when I show up at the hospital, they've already created a story about me um, that shapes the way that I experience and receive care. Yeah. Teresa, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think just to continue to piggyback on what Dr. Pruitt's saying, you know, that experience of the patient as part of the data, right? The fact that we're not acknowledging that they are experienced, experiencing this racism, these microaggressions, right? From the fact that, you know, black patients are, are they don't feel pain the same, apparently, right? But yet we are feeling it where, I saw there was an example um, that I read around um, a, I think it was a TikTok video actually, <laughs> where the nurse is talking about how this patient can't be in a lot of pain because they're having chips. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. there's something about, right, like being able to con like help your, soothe yourself and help to control that, that there's the salt, the crunching, there's like all of these things that go into play so that you're not like, you know, experiencing it, but it's not because you're not in pain, right? And so this nurse, white nurse, had the audacity to say, well, they're not in pain because they're eating chips, right? It's that experience, that everyday experience, because they've made up their mind, right, of, of who you are and what you need, right? Back to some of the earlier conversation, and we're not actually integrating the lived experience of the patient as part of their chart, right, in some, in some level, right? To say, oh, well, here's your background, here's what you've experience in the past. Let me take care of you from that lens, as opposed to these protocols that have used race inappropriately. Yeah. Right, absolutely. And one thing I'll also add to as an example, um, you know, Dr. Smedley talked about institutional practices, policies, right? And so if you look at the policy context, one example that I can lift up when it comes to maternal health is the fact that the Medicaid program 
Once you're in Medicaid as a pregnant person, you have your, your baby, you're knocked off of coverage 60 days after giving birth. That does not make sense, especially for a medical program that disproportionately covers women of color with pregnancy-related care. And so one of the things that we've been working on as advocates is to get Medicaid to extend that coverage to up to at least one year um, after giving birth. But that is also an example of how we see institutional racism show up from a policy perspective. Um, so I want to shift things a little bit and talk about you know, one advancement that you all can mention that you may have seen in the last five to 10 years that you think could be expanded upon. Why don't we start with Jamila? I don't know, this isn't an advancement, I don't think, um, but something that I think absolutely can be and should be expanded upon. And I, and I wanna be clear, there's a lot of like, uh, in the last, I don't know, couple of years, right? This black woman savior story is going around. We're gonna save everybody. Right, the midwives, the doulas, the perinatal health workers, black OBGYNs, the black pediatricians, and um, and we're not, we can't. Right, many of us are still actively working to unlearn all of the things that we were taught during medical education and to find our way back uh, to the liberatory frame that brought us to medicine. But even with that in mind, I do deeply believe that the expansion of care beyond the OBGYN mm -hmm. is, is really going to be what's going to help move us through. I don't think that it is an either or, though, right? I think some people want and need um, specific kinds of care, and it is the responsibility of our systems and structures to provide that, right? That's where Angela's mentioned black feminisms a number of times, right? That's what black feminism is talking about, this understanding that people have um, required differing resources to survive and to thrive. And then of course we see out of that understanding, right, that came, was originally written about in like the early 19th century, folks like Mary Church Terrell yes. and Sojourner Truth and mm -hmm. Frances Harper. And then we see the feminists and the womanists in the 60s who were expanding this framework of black feminism and womanism and move us into identity politics and this understanding that your lived experience can and should be uh, an activating point for you and should be what your political advocacy grows out of. All of those things, this black understanding of black feminism and connecting it to reproductive health and well-being is a really critical piece for me. And the folks that seem to do it best are not the OBGYNs. And so when we think about what our, um, but it's not an innovation, right? Angela talked about in the, in the 1800s, right? We we're talking about black midwifery, midwifery care. My grandmother had all of her children at home with a midwife in her small community. This is not a new phenomenon, but my hope is that this um, awakening that some folks are experiencing around maternity care and maternal health and black maternal health in particular may support a more expansive idea of what this could be for us. <laughs> I do think about a lot of the continuous innovation mm -hmm. <laughs> that happens at the local and community level where you have um, innovations around group prenatal care, where there are um, community-based <laughs> organizations that are doing um, really <laughs> interesting work, again, in, in with low resources, but utilizing um, direct entry midwives um, uh, full spectrum doulas and finding ways to get connected to um, local clinically based OBGYNs to create continuity of care mm -hmm. because we know that because um, you were even mentioning that um, with with a lot of states <laughs> that has not expanded Medicaid especially postpartum Medicaid but um, a lot of community based organizations have tried to fill in that gap and I'm just giving an example of um, group perinatal care, and especially in the postpartum period, right? And finding ways to have things like, for example, sister circles as a way to um, help folks just even start breastfeeding initiation and duration and um, providing those levels of support. It also um, has helped folks to, um, especially black and brown folks, um, get um, into maternal mental health services, right? And so really, that's where the advancements and innovations are happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I try to always say that it needs to get connected back to 
more investments so that, especially at the local and community-based level, because these are the models of maternity and reproductive health care that really needs to be expanded and um, help to, again, reduce a lot of the rates that we see. Um, and one more thing that I feel like we should name, um, you know, because I do feel like in a lot of these spaces, um, especially around health equity, and when we talk about specifically pregnancy and maternal and infant health care, we um, like to focus there, right? And that's why I love the fact that Dr. Parrott is on this panel because um, we also need to bring into the space reproductive health care and in particular abortion care. Right, and that it is intricately a part of maternal health. And I specifically named that because um, even in the um, face of a lot of the sweeping abortion bans, unfortunately in a lot of states, but still yet again, our independent um, abortion clinics, some of our local clinics that are led by black women, we have one here in Atlanta. Um, I wanna lift up Feminist Women's Health Center, but even thinking about how they can even further expand their services to incorporate the full spectrum of not just reproductive health, but also birth, because they are really trying to respond to a lot of their, um, a lot of their patients and the communities that they serve that live at the intersections of, you know, for example, um, you know, gender non-conforming families. That's why we talk about birthing people and folks who are coming into developing their families in the way that they want to define, um, serving our um, undocumented um, uh, brothers and sisters, you know what I'm saying, that are looking and seeking services. And again, these, um, these community clinics and CBOs and the ways in which that they are partnering and utilizing multiple, um, how would we call it? Um, I heard somebody use the phrase um, the other day, allied um, birth worker professionals, because <laughs> they were trying to uh, talk about doulas, um, lactation consultants, um, midwives, everybody, including OBGYNs, but really um, working at the community-based levels. And so I do think that that is a innovation and it can be um, advanced. Uh, yeah, one example I have is, is in some of the work that I'm doing right now is in exploring virtual patient navigation, right? So I'm gonna throw in the tech uh, um, aspect of it in preparation for the talk following us, just yes. stick around. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but in thinking about how we are engaging, particularly our younger generations, in ways that they're used to communicating with each other and building their network. So going, you know, including um, different types of apps, but also going back to the traditional text message. I don't know about you all, but I don't really talk on the phone that much. Zoom calls is as much as I do, but I'll text message back and forth with folks and have a really long conversation. So how do we harness that as part of a digital solution to support the maternity journey and support patients in different ways that is more accessible to them as opposed to this idea of coming to us, right? Like finding those ways that we come to them. But I think to, to both of the points that have been made, how do we then leverage those existing solutions, those existing homegrown innovations to be able to pair it together, right? Because I, I will not name the vendor, but in a conversation with them, a digital vendor, they were talking, you know, I was bringing up some issues around um, supporting uh, refugees and immigrants and with, with these digital tools. And one of them said to me, probably not the person to say this to, well, you know, Brisa, it's digital first. And I said, it's patient first, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? You build your digital solution, you build this around the patient and their experience, right? And so, like I said, stick around for the next conversation because I think we'll talk about that a little bit further. But from the innovative perspective of the last five, 10 years, just how are we using these tech solutions to better communicate and, and increase access for patients? Can I just, one, one thing, and maybe this will be a plug, I'll stick around for the <laughs> one after, because one of the things that concerns me so deeply about that is the connection to criminalization and the risk yep. around digital Absolutely. security. And yep. we know that the folks who are at greatest That's risk right. for poor birth outcomes yep. are the same folks who are at greatest risk for criminalization. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to think about, like as we think about um, innovation, right, mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. new ways forward look like also always constantly thinking about what the the harm could look like what is That's the potential right. harm 
Who's going to be left out of this? How do we center those that are most impacted when we're coming up with these these ideas, mm -hmm. innovations? And um, yeah. so that piece is huge. Yeah. Yeah, I think another point I'll say too that all of the innovations that you all named are were developed by women, you know, larger women of color, and a lot of these resources, you know, they continue to lack the resources they need to, whether it's scale these advancements or be able to duplicate them across the country. Um, so I just want to level the conversation with that because there we don't talk enough about what's already being done, the great things that are being done. And a lot of times we're seeing our colleagues, you know, just not have the capacity to really scale these advancements um, because of a lack of resources. And a lot of times, you know, that funding does go to, you know, white-led entities before it goes to, to these um, populations. Um, so I want to shift things a little bit and talk about measurement. Um, you know, one of the things I'd love for, let's start with Barisa on this one, you to talk about is, you know, the importance of participatory research, but also, you know, what measurements, what do we need to be measuring in order to keep track, not only of these disparities in maternal and infant health, but also to track the innovations that we need to continue to advance when it comes to solutions in this area. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I I lived experience, right? I'm just going to put that out there to frame it. One, um, as a geographer, I have to acknowledge <laughs> <As a> geographer. <laughs> place and space, yeah. right? Yeah. And what happens within those spaces and places that our community interacts with in different ways over time and how those spaces are also changing differently over time. And they change differently and they are experienced differently by different groups of people, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's one of the, the, the metrics, if you will. We, we throw up a map and don't, I mean, obviously a geographer, I love a good map, right? But we throw up these maps with all of these, this incredible zip code, census block data. We even get down to the neighborhood, et cetera. But did we talk to the community that lives in that neighborhood to help us in, interpret what that means? Or to tell us that actually that data is old because the gentrification is happening so quickly, building a clinic here doesn't make sense if you're thinking you're going to help us, right? So I think it's being very intentional around how you're looking at that geographic data, how you're, again, in integrating the lived experience to inform what that is. So I'll start there. Yeah. Yeah. Angela? Um, I'm going to try to name a few things. Um, and this is where I'm like, I need some slides, <laughs> um, but I'm going to do my best in this moment. Um, first and foremost, um, I do think that um, it is important to think about what questions are being asked, how we're asking, but also most importantly, who is asking the question, right? And um, so one, um, at Black Mamas Matter Alliance, we have um, uh, re uh, developed a research principles report that's on our website that just talks about what it looks like to provide holistic maternity care for with, um, for with uh, Black Mamas um, as the center, but also um, thinking about Black women researchers as well and you know their innovation, innovative approaches to research and evaluation methodologies. And so um, that report is on our um, website. And also one of the things that we uplift and center talking about um, experiences is the importance of qualitative research mm -hmm. to be able to be, you know, to, to describe the how and the why um, to support some of our quantitative data. Because we know in um, health equity work, we love some good statistics, right? But it doesn't really get at the fullness of the experiences and what's happening. And so this is where the role of qualitative data, the role of um, evaluation and other forms of research methodology um, comes into play. Um, I do want to lift up um, in this space um, a wonderful organization, National Birth Equity Collaborative, who is working on developing um, different kind of measures around wellness, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and the fact that they have um, also coined the term birth equity um, under Dr. Joy Career Perry and really looking at what does it mean to be, to have um, sexual reproductive and maternal wellness and well-being, you know, and utilizing different types of um, points of uh, indicators, if you will, to um, build into um, 
that piece of measure. So there's just so many ways in which that we can approach um, data collection and also tell our stories that centers um, innovation and not necessarily centering the doom and gloom um, around health disparities and all the things that's wrong, but also, um, again, being able to uplift that the ways in which we're doing this work is the evidence base or it's a best practice. Utilizing, like you said, um, um, maps and other forms of ways of even disseminating that data in a way that's understandable and tangible to the communities that we serve. And just, just one thing to piggyback on that is that's the participatory piece of it is yeah. now you bring in the community as an equitable partner. Um, Dr. Philip Alberti put a, a tweeted yesterday something around, um, we think of academia as being at the universities, at the college, but knowledge mm -hmm. is in the communities. So they are your partners in that, right? And so I think that's where the this, this idea of ensuring that you're looking at it from a participatory um, uh, perspective when you're trying to build these things and bringing in the community partners, uh, the, the community members, et cetera. You know, we have a great group of folks here from a, a lot of different sectors and we're all part of the community as well. But let's also think about next time, how do we have a safe space to bring in community members that are sharing their experiences with us and building these solutions as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna shift to audience questions. Looks like we have one up front here. Yeah, the, the there's, thing you said, there's a mic coming, sir. You said the, the knowledge is in the community. I would take it a little bit further that the data, information, knowledge is in the academia. The wisdom is in the community. I think we need to harness that and find the solutions. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, a such a challenging dynamic, right? I think that I, I've re I've never I won't even say rarely I have never seen an equitable partnership in community in my entire career in research and in medicine. And I think part of it is even now as we're having conversations about community based participatory research, so much of it is happening in a backwards way. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're coming up with the research questions and the ideas and then the, the topics and then coming up with the, the, the methodology and we are going to have the research. And oh, by the way, we're still going to own the data at our institution. So you're going to have to get permission from us to reuse it if you want to, to figure out the data that's coming out of your community. And no, we're not going to do any interpretation of data um, because that's really academic and it's for research publication. Right. But we are going to bring you in as an advisory committee. Mm -hmm. after we've developed all the things, right, to then give us yeah. your input. And so the value is not there. It's not, it isn't the foundation of the research that's, that's coming about, and it doesn't acknowledge the hierarchy in knowledge production yeah. for academic spaces. And so I think that it is bringing folks in um, at the beginning, or even better, carrying our butts over there. Right. Mm -hmm. So this idea that we, everybody needs to come to, to our ivory tower in order to shower us with all of their lived experience and, and knowledge, and then we'll write it up and get all of our funding yeah. around it, uh, does not allow for any equity at the outset. Well, and I would add to that, you know, from the conversation before in terms of diversifying, right, the spaces where and, and who's doing the research, who's engaging with the research, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, to ensure that we can, those of us who have had these different experiences can come to it and, and be advocates, mm -hmm. right? And, and you mentioned positionality earlier. Take that, right? We have a level of power and we can support and bring in the voice and, and ensure that some of those things are changing. But until we're willing to acknowledge it and learn from those mistakes and the different ways that we've not done it correctly, then, then change isn't going to happen. But I think that that's, a solution, that's, an, that's an action step there, right, is starting to make those, those changes. Thank you. So Good morning. You. My name is Helen Beatty, and I am that voice in the community. I'm joined by my brother. We founded an organization in the Mississippi Delta to honor the legacy of our parents. Uh, we are a sibling-inspired community-based organization that has a lot of family focus with relatives. And to your point, having the voice of the community a part of all of these initiatives where you're building out is so critical. Mm -hmm. We recently had an opportunity to sit with a major organization that wanted to uh, look at the work that we were doing, but wanted to us to partner with a major 
another organization that was a research institution. And so it was a, it was a pushback for us because we said, first of all, we have to train these people on what it is that we're doing. We do trauma-informed health literacy. We want to understand what, how ACEs start with children and how do their parents end up with diabetes and hypertension. That's what we do. So building strength-based environments, focusing on that whole, uh, whole goal setting, all of that, we do that with parents very much entrenched in the schools and communities, working with parents, children, and teachers. You can't do it without them. We pushed back and said, to us, that's a sharecropper mentality. We grew up yes. in the Mississippi Ooh, Delta. That's right. We don't roll like that. That's right. And if that's what you're saying that we have to do, then, you know, maybe this partnership might not work for us mm -hmm. because we understand reimbursement rates for <laughs> institutions yes. of higher learning. They've got 51% reimbursement rates. And I'm going to use small numbers. If it's $100,000, then 51000 right. has already gone into fluff fees for the university. So we don't, as a community-based organization, it was a, 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 a hard move. My brothers who were on the call with me looked. Everybody else looked. But I'm happy to say... That organization came to look at us on October 7th in the Mississippi Delta with an initiative that we do every year where we bring all things happening in Mississippi to the Delta. Everything is free. You can get everything from a light bulb to a comprehensive wellness panel there. Nice. So we, we want to invite all of you all down <laughs> next year. But it's when you're talking about community-based organizations and the work, you're right. We, we appreciate organizations like Pfizer for what you do to fortify our work. That's critical because guess what? They don't know Bay Ray. We do. Right. That's okay. Fair. And it's very important to have that voice because we're the trusted source in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. While we're moving to the next question, I just want to lift up one thing and to just put a pin on it. All money isn't good money. Right. Right. And so we are, we are so under-resourced. And it's a very difficult position to be put in uh, to try to decide if you are, if in order to, to take this money, if you what you're willing to trade, because there is always a trade. So thank you for for sharing that and and for walk, being willing to walk away. It's a critical piece of it. Absolutely. Hello, my name is Danielle Gordon. I'm with the American Diabetes Association. Can you speak a little bit about individualized patient approach from physicians to patient and how? Um, how am I trying to frame this? How it's not, I guess, expressed or offered to people of color um, in different communities. I'm, I'm, I just thought, thought about it because I'm thinking about when I was giving birth, I didn't get talked to about midwives. I didn't get talked to about um, alternative methods of giving birth, but I talked to a coworker from, that lived in another state and she was like, yeah, they talked to me about water birth. And I'm like, water birth? That's not something that I've seen in my community, but we're different races, we've had different backgrounds. So can you talk a little bit more about that and what you have seen in your experiences around that? Yeah, um, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> where to begin. So, you know, the, the field of obstetrics and gynecology is late to the patient-centered care uh, kind of framework, the field, right? Not those of us who've been doing work in community and understanding that this is a this is a partnership. Shared decision making is part of it, right? And so, um, so that's that's one piece of it. I think the other piece, and Angela kind of alluded to it earlier, the the doom and gloom in terms of the conversations that we are having in the maternal health space and the way that that frames and biases so many healthcare providers in terms of what we can and cannot or will or will not offer for our communities. I think that though, if I had to unpack Pack, what's really at the um, the crux of it is um, it's the narratives around the brokenness of black and brown people. That is what is at the source of the differential treatment within our systems and particularly in maternal health. This um, generosity of ideas and options for how you you can or should and the circumstances and conditions under which you give birth and who makes that decision is grounded and tied to a belief in agency and autonomy or lack thereof of the person in front of you. And if you have, as a healthcare provider, have decided that you are the one in charge, that you are the one with the power, that it has the decision-making capacity that usurps this person's, then the idea that you would present an array of options never even occurs to you. 
And so when we're thinking about how we, um, what our solutions look like in terms of creating equitable systems, that is the reason why we can do Im implicit bias trainings every minute of every day for the next hundred years for all of the doctors who have been trained in the last 50 years, and we will never address this. We are, we, are, we are working downstream if that's what we're working on. Keep doing it, right? But understand that it has to be paired with some upstream science as well and a broader understanding and not the social determinants. Thank you, I love the public health people, but I don't, people don't understand what that means because people are using it too much. How do you understand what the context of someone's life is and understand social determinants as part of that and connect that to healthcare delivery? So I think that we have a deeper issue and we're really trying to put band-aids on gunshot wounds in the medical field and we have to, we have to flip the table over. Yeah. This is, there is no reformation here. Yeah. There is only revolution. Yeah. That can great. Yeah. I know that's right. <laughs> Just, am I allowed to just add a little bit more? A little bit. We got one minute. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I just wanted to add a little bit more that also the driving force um, behind that is also some of the um, payer systems. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, we've seen in so many cases, even here in Atlanta, we're dealing with that with some closures of some of our hospital systems. But, you know, um, it may not, the, the decision to not provide you an array of options may have been driven by even their reimbursement rates or what is made available in terms of their um, service, services that they can provide. Because some, some hospital entities make more money, for example, off of performing cesareans. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, natural vaginal um, birth, excuse me, all births are natural, natural all excuse me. Vaginal births, such a, in home births, water births, things of that nature, don't necessarily um, provide a higher rate of reimbursement. And I think that that is one of those um, policy areas, healthcare policy areas that definitely from a health equity um, perspective really does need to be um, looked at and um, dealt with. So, and I'm also hoping that that's something that gets talked about in one of the breakout sessions yeah, um, this afternoon. Yeah, I know it's on the agenda for today. So we only probably have like 30 seconds, probably less than that. Hopefully Roy will give me this. Um, one thing I just wanted to say to this young lady back here is just briefly to share that, you know, when I had my son who is 17 now and, and getting ready to go to college, um, I had a lovely black-led OBGYN practice that included midwives and doulas as well. And so just to say that it makes a difference, we've heard a lot about, you know, the importance of diversifying the pipeline of healthcare professionals. So that's also a consideration, um, I bet, in, in, you know, the experience that you may have had or that you may be seeing other women um, and new moms have as well. Um, so in closing, I would like each of you to briefly share one way that, you know, one piece of action, you know, that our um, listeners here today can take with them when it comes to addressing the maternal and infant health crisis in this country. I'll start with Angela. Okay, one piece of thing. Well, go to our website, blackmamasmatter.org. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have all of our literature. You can find a lot of um, information about a lot of issues and solutions there on our website. Get in get engaged and involved in our Black Maternal Health Week campaign that happens every April 11th through 17th. And also by God's grace in 2024, we're looking to have our Black Maternal Health Conference and Training Institute here in our wonderful um, state of Georgia um, in Atlanta. And so yes, go to our website, all the information is there. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just kind of piggyback the earlier conversation around ensuring that you're embedding health equity strategically across all specialties, all points of care, with staffing, you know, and making sure that you center equitably the patient voice um, in that process. Thank you. Um, I guess if I had to, to pick one thing, it's maybe a little a little bit of, of what you're what you're mentioning in terms of equity, but really drilling down what you mean about equity. What are you talking about? How are you specifically addressing it? And how do you understand the role of anti-Black racism in health and equity? Because it is the root of all of it. And it doesn't matter if you're in Idaho or Iowa or 
I don't know wherever black people don't live. If, if that's not what your community <laughs> is, right? That we're everywhere, I know. Um, right, so what are we talking about? If you're talking about health incomes that are tied to racism, say that. If you're talking about black women, say that. If you're talking about indigenous women, say that. If you're, right, so be really explicit about what you're talking about and what the solutions may be and understand that no one is expecting you to figure all of the things out on your own. And that's why collaborative relationships, equitable collaborative, collaborative relationships are critical. Thank you all so much. I could talk to these ladies all day. Um, and thank you all for listening.